I think it was the great philosopher George McFly who said it best when he said, you can do anything you want if you set your mind to it. But our guest this week would argue that's not exactly true. But that shouldn't stop you from pursuing your dreams and goals anyways, as it'll likely lead you to a happier and more fulfilling life. Coming up, our conversation with the author of the book, The Art of Conscious Communication for Thoughtful Men, Jem Fuller. But first, this is The Fit Mess, where together, we learn to develop habits that help us live beyond our mental health struggles to create happier, healthier lives. He's Zach. He lives in the future with his anxiety. He's Jeremy, and he lives in the past with his depression. And we get together once a week in the present to share the obstacles we face and how we overcome them. And making a change is exactly what we're talking about today, starting with a mindset change. In any of this self-development work, I think it always has to start with a mindset shift. You have to get sick enough of your own shit that something has to change. For me, it started with an injury and a fear of a physical debilitation later in life that I've talked about a lot here. For me, that was close enough to rock bottom. It was enough to force me to change my behaviors and take action toward living a healthier, better life. Our hope is that through the kinds of conversations we share here with you each week, that we can help you make the same kind of change before rock bottom, or if you're already there, point you in a direction that may help. And I'll say, when you do hit the rock bottom, right, you you do have to make that choice. You have to take that action. You have to change your mindset. But once you start doing that, and again, you need to start with small changes. Once you start having that success, you've made one change and another change and you look back at how far you've come. The motivation for me is not rock bottom anymore. The motivation for me is to continue growing. If you are at the rock bottom point, you have to remember that at some point your motivation will change, right? You're going to go from, I need to get out of this hole to, I love change and I love making myself get better, but it's a long process. I'm sure you've gone through that too, right, Jeremy? Well, yeah. And the beauty of rock bottom is there's only one place to go and it's up. I don't know. Whenever I'm at rock bottom, I do tend to go left and right a lot and explore it down there (laughs) quite a bit. I really soak it in and spend my time and make sure I know what's there. No, I, I, I'm joking. I don't, I really do try and get back up, but I do, when I am at rock bottom, I do try and pay attention and my rock bottom is different now, right? It's, it's, a little bit higher, but I really, really, when I'm there, I focus on it and remember it and really commit it to memory of what it feels like. So that when I am a little bit higher, I don't forget what that's like. And I can continue to motivate myself in, it, in a it, different way. It can be a fantastic motivator to, to help you avoid getting there again. And, and I'll tell you, I am better than I was when I started this path many years ago, but you do fall down all the time and Mm -hmm. you keep getting hurt and you have to keep getting back up. So any illusion you have that by meditating or doing yoga or or any of any of the stuff that we talk about every week, any illusion you have that that is going to fix you and that you are one day going to wake up and everything's just going to be glorious. It's not, Mm -hmm. it's just not, this is a lifelong thing. And it is an effort that you have to make every day to keep trying to improve and keep trying to change so that you don't revert to your old ways and end up with the same kind of pain that put you on this path to begin with. Yeah. And just remembering too, that like the higher you get in this journey, your brain still remembers how to feel rock bottom. It still has all those pathways to make you feel like you're so much lower than you actually are. So for me, like, even though I'm like, eight steps ahead of where I was two years ago, when I do fall down, I really only fall down two or three steps, but it feels like I fell down the entire eight steps in the moment. And just recognizing that you really didn't fall down that far. Your mind just goes there naturally. It's a path really well worn and it can just turn on in an instant and it's up to you to fix that. And that's why your commitment to this work is so important and deciding that no matter what, you're just going to keep doing whatever the things are that you implement every single day to live a better life. Our guest today knows rock bottom pretty well. He hit it himself and it was enough to make him change his life. It's a life that's been an extraordinary one full of adventures. He has been an actor, a singer, a songwriter, a barefoot backpacker, a fire dancer. And now he's an expert in mindset and communication leading retreats around the world. Our interview with Jem Fuller begins with his rather ordinary upbringing. It was your ordinary kind of middle-class upbringing in a, in a suburb in Melbourne, a city in Australia, all kind of pretty standard. And then the, the normal life things happen, the, the normal painful life things happen that we all go through. And um, when I was turning 18, my best friend died on a motorbike and that was in my last year of high school. And that sent me on a bit of a spin 
then. And then as soon as I finished high school, I just needed to get to the other side of the world. I just wanted to get as far away as possible. I had grown up traveling a little bit. I was born overseas and my father was from a different country. So we had traveled a little bit, but, but I always had this curiosity about the big wide world. So pretty much through most of my twenties, I was either traveling somewhere or, or, or somewhere else earning money to keep traveling. And the countries that I was most interested in were the countries that were culturally and, and geographically as different to where I grew up. And with the benefit of hindsight, now I can look back and perhaps understand subconsciously why I was drawn to very different countries to where I, I grew up. And it was this, this curiosity around cross-cultural connection and cross-cultural communication. I really was interested to talk with people from very different backgrounds to me. You know, whether that was a, a religious background or a cultural background or a geographical background that was just very different to mine. And I was always on this kind of mission, unbeknownst to myself in my twenties, to connect with these people and find out what we had in common. And that makes sense to me now. So through my, my kind of wild adventurous days, I, I did everything from fire dancer to tattooist to kindergarten teacher and volunteer in third world countries and healer and all sorts of different things. Then jump forward to when I first became a father in my early thirties. And I thought, wow, I better get some sort of job or career to provide for these kids. And I ended <laughs> up working for an international travel company because I didn't know what else to do. Had a, a pretty successful eight years with them, climbed the, climbed the corporate ladder, so to speak, and ended up the last three years in a senior corporate leadership position with a lot of staff and a lot of zeros behind the numbers that we had to crunch. And learned a lot about leadership, learned about human behavior, learned about think, you know, fun things like neuro-linguistic programming and, and profiling, that kind of stuff. But also found out that I really wasn't built for this pressure to drive net profit growth month on month on month. And I, and I was caught in that rat race and essentially deeply unhappy, drinking too much alcohol, not seeing my kids, working 14 hours a day, that, that old story. And then mm -hmm. I had my midlife awakening in my early forties, my midlife crisis slash awakening and, um, and everything changed. And I did a lot of work on myself. I lost my job. I came out of a marriage that had gone too far South. I lost my house. I pretty much lost everything except my kids. And that was nine years ago. And I started this coaching journey. And since then I've become an executive coach. I run retreats in the Himalaya and Bali and the, the deserts of Northern Australia. I work with, you know, CEOs across the government and private sectors and not-for-profit sectors. And then most recently have just written a book, The Art of Conscious Communication for Thoughtful Men. So it's a story with a happy ending so far. I'm about to turn 51 and my boys are about to turn 18 and 16. So they're becoming young men themselves. And we live in a beautiful, beautiful place down the coast by surf beaches here in Australia. And I've got plenty of time to surf. I drink a hell of a lot less. I spend more time with my kids. I even exercise more now, which is nice as well. So yeah, that's my story. I want to zone in on the point where you went from the typical corporate ladder, having it all to it all going away and making that shift. How much of that shift happened intentionally and how much of it was sort of forced upon you? You, you mentioned you lost your job. Is that you were let go or you decided that's enough? I, I need a different if a different path. Tell us about that point where everything shifted for you. Yeah. So it, it was a combination of stuff happening to me and I'm doing it in inverted commas because I think there's a deeper conversation around how much we attract through our behavior. I, you know, at the time I, 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 I was forced to leave. It was a very unceremonious you're out. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and I was literally walked out of the building and, and wow. accused of a whole bunch of stuff I didn't do. It was very unfair. And I, mean, I was on the phone to lawyers and I could have gone down the, the unfair dismissal path, but the employer had, had thought about that. And the, the handshake that they offered me was only just a little bit short of what I would have got if I had gone to court and it would have taken a year and yada, yada. So I decided to just take it and leave. So yes, I, yes, I, w I was fired, but I look back now and I, I think that I sabotaged. I think my behavior leading up to that point gave them enough reason to do that. So I don't, I don't feel, I don't blame anybody for really anything that's happened in my life. I believe that I've created it all. I mean, certainly there are things that happen that are out of our control, but I believe that we have, we have some choice around how we choose to respond mm -hmm. to those yeah. events. Um, but that, that happened just shortly after quite a remarkable night. And I, I don't know how 
as spiritual or not your listeners are, mm -hmm. uh, but this is just what happened. I, I sit in a men's circle, have been for a long time, and it's a group of men. We sit around a fire, we pick a theme, and we talk about a theme and what it means to us. No alcohol, no drugs, just a conversation. And one night we decided to have a, a North American Indian sweat lodge. Have you guys heard of a sweat? Sure, yeah, yeah. 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 Are yeah. you in Canada? Of course you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> in Australia, in Australia, people don't know what I'm talking about. Um, so we had a sweat on Aboriginal, Australian Aboriginal land here in Australia. And I had an out-of-body experience. I was, you know, it was probably because I was in the sweat. It was a really hot sweat and I was in there for a long time. And I went into a trance and had an out-of-body experience and became my five-year-old boy. And I was flying around as this five-year-old and, and I figured this out later on that up until the age of five, I still was at the age of innocence. And then it was when I was at the age of six that something happened that really rocked my innocence. And, and when I was six years old, I started to run this racket, but it's a very human racket that I'm not good enough. You know, I'm not good enough yeah. for the love of my father. Essentially, that was the relationship that I'd pinned it to. But prior to then, I, I, you know, there was no question of not being good enough. Life was good and easy, right? Sure, sure. Um, so I had this amazing out-of-body experience. I went home that night and, and had a very, very, very lucid and prophetic dream. Came, woke up in the morning and I knew exactly what it meant. It was like, wow, I've had this background belief up until the age of 42 that I'm not good enough. And when we believe something, we tend to become our own self-fulfilling prophecy, right? For sure, yeah. We, we distort the information around us to match our beliefs. So something will happen and we go, oh, I knew I wasn't good enough yep. or we'll sabotage. So I had a, a, a career that was heading in a very successful direction and in ways, you know, I, I sabotaged it. And that was because I thought I didn't deserve it. Right. So that was the bit that kind of happened to me. I didn't plan that, but then I got really curious about the plasticity of the brain and can we change our beliefs? Can we change the, the wiring? And so I started reading a whole bunch of books, including Joe Dispenza and all these sorts of people. And then it became very conscious and very intentional. And I went to work on myself and I literally threw just repetition, daily, daily repetition of repeating to myself, I'm good enough. <laughs> I am enough. I do deserve happiness. And, and so then I consciously changed the wiring and then things changed. Then I, then I got myself out of the toxic marriage. Then we had to sell the house. And I'd already lost the job, but then I started creating this life that I've got now. So initially it was, it happened to me. And then from then I took it on board and, and went to work. Yeah. Wow. That's ama an amazing story. The question that I have for you is about mindset and, you know, how things that we can do to change it, but man, you, you just went through the gamut on, on changing your mindset for sure. Didn't you? Yeah, I did. It took about six to 12 months of high repetition before I started to notice any change. And in those first six months, I didn't even believe it. Mm -hmm. I didn't even believe it. You know, I was saying to myself, whenever I was alone, I wasn't doing it in public. Otherwise I would have been locked up. But whenever I was alone, I was saying it out loud over and over and over again. I would even be driving and make up a song. I am good enough just the way I am. I, and I just kept saying it <laughs> over and over. And I thought, gee, I hope this works. Yeah. You know, because I'd got to a point in my life where, and I'm happy to be vulnerable, my anxieties around not being enough, I had kept under a blanket of shame. I hadn't told anybody and they had manifested in my, my sexual ability or which became a disability. And in my marriage, I, I developed a real sexual dysfunction, mm. anxiety attacks, the inability to be able to perform not feeling good enough. And I was so ashamed. I didn't even tell anyone. My, my wife obviously had to go through this as well, sure. but no one knew, not even my best friends. Cause I felt so, so ashamed. Thankfully through this work, that's all changed. Right. But at the time I didn't even believe it, but I was so desperate because I, I was born. Luckily I was born an optimist and I had this one glimmer of hope going, surely the second half of my life doesn't need to be this horrible. Surely not. Surely there's a way. You know, so I grabbed onto these books and I, and I pinned my hopes on them and I went, this neuroplasticity work that I'm going to engage in, I'm just really hoping it does something. And sure enough, over 12 months, I started to believe it. Those neurons started to wire together. And now it's, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a belief. It's just a, a reflex automatically firing set of neurology where I, of course I'm good enough. How could I not be? 
you know, and so I, I am on a little bit of a mission to share this story and, and help other people who want to improve their relationship with self, their state of mind. Mm -hmm. Um, because when you, when you change, as you guys know, when you change in here, when you improve what's going on in here, your experience with life improves, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So with that, you know, I, I have glimpses of that. I'm, I'm in sort of a wave right now where, where I feel like as long as I make a decision and take action on it, whatever I go after is going to work. It's fine. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, I, I've also, I've battled depression my entire life and certain times it will rear its ugly head. And all of a sudden I'm not good enough and I don't deserve to be in the same room with my family and I don't deserve the love of people around me. Mm. And then it's a, you know, it's a long climb to get back out of that. That's, that's maybe more of, of the opposite extreme. Mm. I imagine that in, in our audience, there are people like you, people like me and a lot in between that hear things like you can accomplish anything you set your mind to. You, you just got to set your, your intention on something and, and go after it from a practical standpoint, from, you know, just getting just really into the, uh, techniques. What do you recommend to people to, to change that mindset, to change the wiring? Like what, what can people do aside from, you know, maybe they don't have access to the sweat lodge, you know, and, and maybe they don't want to sing to themselves in the car or whatever, but what would you, what do you recommend to people to, to, to make that switch, to get that mindset where it needs to be, to, to let go of all those demons from the past and really go after whatever it is they want in their life? Yeah. So a couple of macro bullet points and, and, and I, I will get really practical with you. But the first thing I want to say is that I don't necessarily believe that you can have anything you want. I don't necessarily believe that you can say, I'm going to go and create a multi-million dollar business and it will work. Mm -hmm. I do believe you can improve your experience of existence in this moment. I do believe you can enhance your relationship with life. I, I believe that you can improve your your, your, your equilibrium. I, can, I believe that you can improve that slightly. You can, your day to day experience of, of well being and happiness, you can improve. When I set a goal for something, you know, I've got a goal to sell a hundred thousand copies of my book this year. We just, we just published a book and I'm, I'm so I've set a goal. I've got zero attachment to that number. Mm -hmm. If I only sell a thousand copies, I will be as happy as if I sold a hundred thousand because my happiness my sense of who I am and my happiness doesn't rely on some future goal coming true or not anymore because they don't always come true. So I mm -hmm. think it's a fallacy to say you can do whatever you want because I don't know if you can, sure. but you can certainly create habitual practices that improve your relationship with yourself, which is, is your relationship to the past and your relationship with the present moment, which then in turn flavors the future you create for sure. Right, right. So now to get a little bit more practical, this relationship with self, this, this, this gentle nurturing and curating of your state of mind is a practice. It's like yoga. You don't get good at yoga and tick a box and go, right, I've done that. I don't need to do yoga anymore. <laughs> or Pilates for me, it's Pilates, right? If I stop doing Pilates, my body deteriorates. Sure. And I need to keep doing Pilates. Otherwise my back will start to play up. So it's a practice. Meditation for me has become a practice. If I stop meditating, my mind starts to get, you know, a bit cranky again, you know, so it's a, it's something that you, we need to create some habitual practices and the practice of self acceptance, I believe is, is a really worthwhile practice. Okay. So self acceptance really is understanding and, and allowing reality because in reality, you are exactly who you're supposed to be right now. You, apparently because there you are. <laughs> right, right. right. So you Otherwise we'd be somewhere be, else, right? <laughs> right. You'd be, you'd be someone else and you shouldn't be someone else. Apparently you should just be you with all your bits and bobs, with all your stuff. You're the perfect version of you in this moment right now. Of course, we look to improve, evolve as we move forward. But in this snapshot, in this moment right now, you're exactly enough of everything to be you. So that's the first thing of going, okay, well, here I am. Self-acceptance is an acceptance of the past and it's a practice. So to get technical now for you, I find that putting things on vibration through language, through words, i.e. saying something out loud is helpful. And we could go into the science of that, the vibration, the neurons firing together. When you say something, those neurons have to fire together, right? Mm -hmm. So saying something out loud on repetition daily. 
So there's a bunch of science now showing that affirmations actually do something neuroscientifically. They actually do something. So you set a little sticky note next to your bed with your affirmation on it. I am enough or you know, whatever your affirmation is. Today's a great day. And you say it every morning, you create a habitual practice. So now for me, I don't have the sticky note next to the bed. It's just become habitual for me to meditate, say my affirmations and then get in the shower. So we're creating a routine each day, but I believe saying things out loud helps contemplation. So you said not everyone goes into a sweat lodge and has the, the, the awakening moment. But if you can schedule some time for contemplation, you know, we're so distracted these days, these things just, mm -hmm. you know, you notice someone go and wait for the bus and they've got a two minute wait for the bus and they're straight onto their device. Nobody sits still doing nothing anymore. <laughs> right. Wow. No, so, so true. set aside some time for contemplation. Just sit for 10 minutes. Don't meditate. Don't do anything. Just sit and contemplate, you know? And if you listen really carefully, listen to that subtle dialogue with self, you know, because there's always those thoughts going. Just listen to the quality of the self talk. And what's the quality of your self coaching like? Are you horrible to yourself? Do you use horrible expletives and, and, and damaging words to yourself? Or are you kind? to yourself so you can really just get curious around what's going on in here and then change it you know and when i say just change it it's very simple not easy i know it's not easy but it's let's keep it simple right i'm going to choose the words i say to myself about myself and i'm going to say them out loud i know for me getting to a point of self-acceptance was really really hard but once i got there I hit another roadblock of if I'm okay where I'm at now and I've got these goals, how do I get the motivation to move beyond where I'm okay with? Because a lot of the change that I made was because I was so uncomfortable and not okay with who I am. So you said it's, it's easy to say, once we get to that self-acceptance piece, how do we continue to motivate ourselves mm -hmm. to grow and get better? and do better. Yeah. So I've weaved into my sense of identity, my ego, who I think I am, which has been volitional now. And by that, I mean, on purpose, I've and mm -hmm. very conscious, I've created a sense of who I choose to be, who is Jem, And I've put into that sense of identity. So I, my sense of identity is I'm a kind, caring, loving, passionate, compassionate, action taking man. So I've put action taking in there. So when I say this to myself every day, which I do, I've, I've identified as someone who takes action, right? I've created that. And mm -hmm. I think what happens is that when we, for me anyway, I'm not sure if this happens for everybody, but I've coached many thousands of hours and I've noticed this in, in the humans that I've worked with. When we tick our boxes of our needs, so some certainty and some variety, some significance, connection, you know, and our sense of identity is pretty healthy, we tend to naturally move towards contribution. Humans mm -hmm. naturally want to make a, a positive difference in somebody else's life, whether it's just their partner or their children, or for some people it's their community, or for some people it's globally. So that's that drive to contribute is there. If you think about that drive to contribute and foster that, nurture that, and find something in life that you are passionate about, it should be better, you know, and you can marry that together with your natural talents. Then you've got a purpose. Then you've got a meaning to your life that is not just survival, you know, and when we have this passion or this purpose, that creates the drive to try and make a better future, whether it's just for you or for your family or for your community. You know, so it's about finding something that, that means something to you and leveraging that against yourself to go, do you know what? I'm not going to just sit by and let that be what it is. I want to do something to try and improve, you know, that piece there. I asked the question for a lot of our listeners. And I think that was probably one of the things that really changed in me once I went on this journey was, and that's why we do the show, right? I'm trying to give back. I'm trying to do things for the community and help people you know, navigate the same kind of struggle that I went on. That's, I mean, that's where the name of the show came from, the fit mess. Well, and I think there's something to the idea also that, uh, you know, when, when you are struggling to just get comfortable and to have that self-acceptance, there's so much numbing of just the pain. But when you do get to the point of self-acceptance, it becomes easier to see beyond 
just mm. being okay. You, you suddenly want to pursue, how can I feel even better? It's funny how it just sort of feeds on itself, where yeah. before you reach that point, it's just a constant, how can I numb? How can I just make this go away? Yeah, that's so true. It is. And it's uh, to any of your listeners who are, who are wondering about, you know, if I come to a, com- a place of complete acceptance of myself and, and the status quo, if I come to a place of acceptance, does that mean apathy? Does that right. mean that I, well, I'm so accepting of everything right now that it's, I'm just going to let it all go. And it doesn't mean that, like you just suggested, when you come to this place of acceptance and okayness, so less, less suffering, there's this space that tends to naturally fill with how could things be if I went and did this, yeah. you know? And so acceptance doesn't mean apathy. It just means, you know, um, not trying to control the things you can't, you know, and, and, fo- and that gives you more bandwidth mentally, emotionally, physiologically, it gives you more bandwidth to focus on the things that you can influence, you know? And I yeah. think we have a natural desire to evolve in a positive direction. You know, unless you're part of the tiny minority of the human race, which is unfortunately psychopathic and they can't help that. So put them to the side. I'm not talking about psychopaths, <laughs> right. I'm talking about the rest. Mm. No, no one wakes up in the morning going, how can I go and hurt? Or right. how can I go and cause damage? I don't know. We're, you know, we're pretty people... big in the psychopath community. I, I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I was gonna, I'm not going to say politicians and psychopaths. I'm going right. to say General Joe Blow, you, me, you, right. me, and your listeners, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to presume that most of us wake up in the morning going, I want to try my best. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. You know, so when you decrease suffering, it does open up more space for doing good, good stuff to Yeah. We have just a couple of minutes left, which uh, to me indicates we will have to have you back on because I'm fascinated by your book, which we have just barely even mentioned. Please uh, tell us about the, this book and, and sort of the, your passion behind it and what people are going to find from your book. Okay. So super quick, I started writing about communication because through my hours of coaching, you know, whether it's coaching executives or, or, you know, individuals and couples coaching relationships as well, people trip over in communication and quite often we, we want the same greater good outcome, but we, we come to loggerheads with each other in the miscommunication. So that's why I started writing about communication and also more broadly, the world seems to be, seems to be deteriorating into we're losing, we're forgetting how to communicate. People are shouting at each other across these digital divides of political difference or ideological difference. And they're just shouting at each other and it's not doing anything, you know, cancel culture and public shaming and all of this stuff. I don't believe it's helping the situation. I think we need to remember how to communicate more effectively. So I started writing the book, a book writing mentor of mine said, you need to pick an audience. And she said, I think this would book would be go really well for men right now because men have been culturally indoctrinated with old stereotypes that are dysfunctional. And so I want to do what I can to help men improve the brand of men. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wrote it for men, but funnily enough, it was published in November last year and it's women who are buying it, picking it off the shelves and then reading it and then taking it to their husbands or partners and saying, honey, can you please read this? This, this sounds very familiar to our show. We, we very much went, went in with the same idea and we hear from women all the time. I wish my husband or my boyfriend would listen to this show. It's, it's so yeah. funny how this <laughs> yeah. happens. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's the, the story of the book. And I, I would love to dive more into that with you another time. We are up against the clock here. So uh, where can people find out more about you, your coaching services, and of course your book? So they can go to gemfuller.com, J-E-M-F-U-L-L-E-R.com. That's, that's me. They can get the book from the website or from Amazon. Just jump onto Amazon and search for Jam Fuller and you'll find the book. Jem, thanks so much. This has been a really just fascinating conversation and let's do it again. Yep. Nice to meet you both. Our thanks to Jem Fuller, author of the book, The Art of Conscious Communication for Thoughtful Men. You can find links to him and his work in the show notes for this episode at thefitmess.com. There are so many great takeaways from that interview. I, I wish we had so much more time with him. It all starts with making a change, and that starts with compassion and acceptance. You have to get okay with who you are and where you are and where you came from before you can really start to look forward to who you want to be and and the life that you want to live. No, maybe you can't be the next Jeff Bezos, but setting any goal that points you toward a better action will result in a better you. Yeah, he said two lines in there that I actually, like as I was re-listening to the interview, like I paused it and went back and listened to these two lines again. And they just, they really resonated with me. And it was improve your experience of existence and enhance your relationship with life. And it was just like, wow, it, it, it's kind of that simple. Like, yeah. I know it's easier said than done, but holy shit. Like it's just 
that's a little bit like you don't have to become a billionaire. You don't have to start a massive business. You don't have to be an Olympic level athlete. You just have to be a little bit better and you have to have that self-compassion and enhance your relationship with your life. I, I love that. And, and it just hits on what we talked about a, a couple of weeks ago about the idea of just becoming the version of you that lives the life you want to live. So if you want to be able to run around with your grandkids, you, you physically have to be able to do that whenever that time comes. If you want to be able to run around with your kids now, and maybe you can't, then you got to do something about it. If you want to eat better, you have to make the choices at the grocery store that are going to put the right food in your house so that you're not tempted by the bad choices that we tend to make over and over again. It's all about just creating the life that you want and taking the action toward making that life a reality. Yeah, those all sounded like really great examples, but I got to go back a couple of episodes. My goal, I'm stealing from Alan Meisner. I want to be able to wipe my ass when I'm 105. <laughs> that is a good one. Uh, a lot of great advice in this interview also, uh, but I also want to encourage you that you know it doesn't take going into a sweat lodge in the forest or in the desert to make a massive change. You can just do the small things, like he said, repeating affirmations every morning that tell you that you're good enough, eating a little better, try some yoga, try some meditation, whatever it is, do those small things, but do them over and over until they become habits, because those habits are the things that will guide you toward the life that you're capable of creating. And if you want help with forming or keeping those habits, or you want to just have some accountability, you can join us in our Facebook group where you and fellow FitMess listeners can connect for monthly challenges, accountability to reach your goals, and just a, a supportive community there. You can find that link at our website, thefitmess.com, where we will be back next week with a brand new episode. Thanks for listening. See you, everyone. We know this podcast is amazing and doesn't seem to lack anything, but we need a legal disclaimer. Prior to implementing anything discussed in this podcast, it is your responsibility to conduct your own research and consult your physician. You should assume that Jeremy and Zach don't know what they're talking about, and they're not liable for any physical or emotional issues that occur directly or indirectly from listening to this podcast.